There once dwelled on this earth creatures so strange and wondrous that 65 million years after their extinction, they still excite the imagination of man. They were fierce and carnivorous monsters, and at the same time, they were gentle giants. They came surprisingly in all shapes and sizes and lived in a world not unlike our own among birds and frogs, crocodiles and insects. They evolved from the creatures who crawled out of the sea millions of years before. They were indomitable. They were the lords of their universe. After a reign of 140 million years, they mysteriously vanished. They left behind them a record locked in the earth, fossilized secrets that only hint at the majesty of their reign. Millennia later, man would call them the dinosaur, Greek for the terrible lizard. Terrible because we initially perceived them as giant monsters. But as we learned more about them, our attitudes changed. Fear became wonder. Curiosity became concern. Could their destiny become ours? Could their fate preview our own? When we first began to learn about dinosaurs only 150 years ago, we didn't realize how successful a creature they were. But with each new bone came new knowledge. And as we learned about their life, we came to learn about their death. From the beginning, they intrigued us. Who were they? How did they live? Why did they die? Modern science and technology are now being utilized to solve the mystery of the dinosaur. It's the ultimate detective story. As scientists unearth more clues about their fate, they may also find an answer to the question, if dinosaurs can perish, what about man? Dinosaur. It's a magical word to some. To others, it has a negative meaning, something too big and too old to last. However, it has a special place in our imagination and in our movies. It's big and it's ferocious. It's deadly. And more often than not, an enemy to man. abuse the dinosaurs, not only by what they do to them on screen, but with the myths that they originated about them. Man did not live at the time of the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, however, are part of our lives today. We see them in movies and on television. Our kids play with them. The toys are stuffed or mechanical. A giant one soars above us as a balloon in New York's Thanksgiving Day Parade, which begins every year right outside this building. And every year, almost a million people come into the building, the American Museum of Natural History, to look up and to wonder at this and other magnificent animals. I can remember the first time I saw this giant collection of bones. I came here with my family when I was about five, and I can remember bringing them to life in my imagination. Join us now for this first time ever look at a world authentically recreated, especially for this program. The world of the dinosaur.
The end always fascinates. How could a 140 million year reign be extinguished so mysteriously and with such finality? What terror came out of the skies to end the dinosaurs? Or was it terror of another kind? Whatever it was, it stripped the earth clean of 75% of all plant and animal life and all the dinosaurs. Among them, the hadrosaur, a gentle giant over 30 feet long and weighing three tons. Called a duck-billed dinosaur because of the shape of its mouth, these giants were vegetarians. They lived on the edge of forests. It is speculated that, unlike modern reptiles, they lived in herds to protect themselves from predators. Hadrosaurus, Brontosaurus, Tyrannosaurus rex. The names themselves are exciting. Pterodactyls, Stegosaurus, Monoclonius. They're just fun to say. The words themselves become pictures. You look at these fossilized bones and you say the words and you can see into their world, a world that's not unlike the animal kingdom of today. Mating calls, nest building, laying of eggs, and the dramatic and suspenseful battle to survive. We're going to see how a family of duckbills tries to do just that, how animals like these lived out their lifespan of almost 100 years. We're going to take these animals out of our dreams and our nightmares, out of the dark corners of our fantasies to enjoy their uniqueness. We're going to try to understand why they populate not only our museums, but our landscapes. These are dinosaurs built from the remains of automobile spare parts taken from junkyards and hammered and welded into prehistoric giants. For sculptor Jim Gary, they represent the realization of a childhood dream. He's been able to populate his world with the creatures that fascinate. Jim Gary has sculpted scores of dinosaurs, and he's transported them to shows around America where they've enthralled children of all ages. I've always liked dinosaurs, and I always wanted one for a pet, so now I have my own. So I had to create my own because nobody else could find one for me. Children of all ages search for and find dinosaurs everywhere from comic books to Disney World Space Age New Epcot Center. Dinosaur parks draw huge crowds throughout Canada and the United States. Dinosaurs welcome us along our highways and infiltrate the most private domains of our home. And they find their way not only onto our plates, but into our winter carnivals and our summer festivals. They caught on quickly, the dinosaurs. In 1922, Sherlock Holmes' author promoted a hoax. Today, the national magazines recognize their popularity. Toys, t-shirts, pajamas, all bear the signature of this unique giant. And on television, one of our favorite characters lives and works among them. Well, like most children, I was fascinated from dinosaurs right from the beginning, as long as I can remember, of course, say, age six or before, because dinosaurs were exotic animals, and unlike uh, the monsters you see in the monster movies, they were real. My favorite dinosaur is, I think it's the Tyrannosaurus. Absolutely, the Brontosaurus. Probably the Triceratops, because I don't like meat eaters. Brontosaurus because he's a sweet guy. <laughs> is it Tyrannosaurus rex? Is that the one that flies? Dinosaurs are really cute, but I wouldn't want to marry one, unless he were rich. I think Fred Flintstone has it made. He has a live dinosaur for a pet. Ah, uh, <laughs> look at Dino over there. Look how he's lying there missing me. Hey, Dino. Psst, psst, Dino. 
Here, Dino, come to Daddy. Come to Daddy and show him how much you miss him. That's a good Dino. You miss your dad, Dad, don't you? Ouch! How do you like that? And he's supposed to be man's best friend. Man's best friend and woman's. Akita! Uh -huh. Dinosaurs were part of the earliest films. From the beginning, as with this 1919 animated cartoon, Gertie the Dinosaur, the movies have represented at least some of them as gentle and as having modest appetites. The 1922 film, The Lost World, paralleled the discovery of a nest full of dinosaur eggs in the Gobi Desert in Asia. As the worldwide hunt for dinosaur bones continued, the film audience's appetite for the giant monsters on the screen increased. In the recent film, Caveman, the dinosaur's appetite was satisfied by Ringo Starr. Thinking quickly, he saved actress Shelley Long by feeding the dinosaur an intoxicating herb. Fortunately, an inquisitive world's knowledge of dinosaurs did not depend on the movies. Scientists like Jack Horner transformed their childhood enthusiasm for dinosaurs into an adult discipline. Horner of Montana State University has only recently uncovered a major find of hadrosaur bones. He has made the duckbill dinosaur a household word to scientists. The reason that we know more about duckbill dinosaurs is that, is that we have found um, a small area where we have concentrations of, of nests, uh, nests containing eggs, some containing babies, uh, juveniles, and an area right nearby that, that is so far has yielded 40 or 50 dinosaurs, but we have the remains of 10,000 individuals from a herd. So in this one area, we're able to see the life history of, of a duckbill dinosaur from the time it hatched until it was at least half grown with an adult. Horner's finds, which illustrate that some dinosaurs lived in herds and cared for their young, tell us that some dinosaurs had traits more common to warm-blooded mammals than cold-blooded reptiles. Horner's dig is near Montana's Glacier National Park. It is known as Egg Mountain. His findings confirm how the duckbills may have built their nests. Based on the evidence that these dinosaurs herded, some scientists assume that the nest building was a collaborative effort within the herd. Like reptiles today, the nest is protected before and after the egg laying. Horner has recently discovered a fossilized egg which he believes contains the embryo of a duckbill dinosaur. At a Montana medical center, the fossil was subjected to a CAT scan, or computerized axial tomography. A CAT scan is normally used to take a three-dimensional computerized color picture of the brain. Here, it will photograph the insides of an 80 million year old egg. The CAT scan was able to establish that an embryo is inside the fossilized egg. The embryo is identified and marked. It's a remarkable find. A 
duck-billed dinosaur, it's believed, laid 20 to 25 eggs in a circular pattern. Scientists don't know how long it took for the eggs to hatch, but they do know that the eggs were about eight inches long, about the size of a grapefruit, surprisingly small for what would eventually become a three-ton duckbill. Life for the duckbills was hazardous from the start. The Struthiomimus, an agile and fleet-footed dinosaur that resembles the modern-day ostrich, was a predator that mother duckbills feared most. The Struthiomimus, with little in the way of a defensive arsenal, no horns, no giant tail, no sharp talons, was a natural victim for other, more aggressive dinosaurs. The speed of the Struthiomimus, normally its strongest asset, occasionally failed it especially when matched by that of the Deinonychus. The Deinonychus, Greek for terrible claws, were fierce creatures that weighed less than 200 pounds. may have traveled in hunting packs like wolves today. Their speed and their dreaded claws made them fearsome enemies. For the duckbill, survival was possible by the number of eggs originally laid. Life, the species, could continue. Dinosaur eggs hatched like those of other reptiles today. At birth, the baby dinosaur was only 12 inches long and about one and a half pounds. If he made it to adulthood, he'd grow to be 6,000 pounds. How do we know what we know about dinosaurs? Well, for one thing, we know how duckbill eggs looked because Jack Horner has found hundreds of them fossilized in Montana. We know that this giant creature probably made a deep bleating noise, not unlike a goose, because of the size of its nasal cavity and the length of its air passage. Given these clues, we can guess at the type of sound it actually would have made. It's like a jigsaw puzzle or a detective story. You find one piece and it fits into another. And it all begins with digging holes. First, somebody finds a fossilized bone, more often than not a tourist or an amateur, and that signals a scientific bone rush expedition, because where there's one bone, there may be others. What survives usually is not actually bone. Most bones turn into dust. Fortunately, some fossilize, becoming hardened mineral deposits. Once extracted, often still encased in rock, the fossils are then put in a plaster of Paris cast to be moved to a museum or a lab for further cleaning and study. Dinosaur finds have been discovered on every continent except Antarctica and in at least 20 states with the biggest finds in the Rocky Mountain area.
Paleontologists don't always agree on how to put the fragments of bones together. It's as if one were to go into an auto junkyard to try to assemble a car out of all the scrap. You could wind up with an Edsel bumper on a Cadillac body with wheels by Chrysler. Paleontologist Phil Curry. If you can imagine that sometime in the future, cars have been replaced by some other mode of transportation, and a scientist came across this car graveyard. He found a lot of partial cars and a lot of spare parts. But only certain fenders will fit on certain cars and certain wheels on other cars. And so eventually, he can get a best guess interpretation of what a particular model of car looked like. In a similar manner, a paleontologist who finds a dinosaur bone bed which consists of a lot of skeletons that are mixed up. Some are partially complete, some are actually um, completely dismembered. He takes the spare parts, and by best guess, he tries to figure out what animals they belong to. Eventually, he reconstructs the animal. Now, if he's lucky, eventually a complete skeleton will be found somewhere else, and it'll confirm what he's suspected all along. Paleontologists who study prehistoric life through fossilized plants and animals are forced to work with the tiniest of fragments. Lost for ages, these fragments must be dated, cleaned, and pieced together. It's no wonder that a major museum recently replaced the head of its brontosaurus. For 50 years, it mistakenly had the wrong head mounted on it. Other museums now are re-evaluating their skeletons, sifting through the evidence to see if they're presented correctly. Scientists can also learn about the environment in which the dinosaurs lived by studying the virtually indestructible pollen grains of the flowers around at the time. The pollen is identified by enlarging it 30,000 times on an electron microscope. A dinosaur may have enjoyed the fruits of this plant for dessert. The detective pursues fingerprints, paleontologists pursue footprints. Dinosaur tracks have been found from New England to Texas. Often they're found before the bones are. From the tracks, paleontologists can learn how heavy a dinosaur was, how fast it might have moved. Unlike bones, dinosaur tracks are frozen moments of history. A predator stalked its prey, causing a stampede in Australia. A dinosaur seemed to hesitate as it walked slowly across a slippery mud flat in prehistoric Arkansas. The teaching about dinosaurs in schools today is no longer limited to just book reading and museum trips. Kids have more fun modeling clay and making movies. And youngsters, like the scientists, have learned how to challenge current hypotheses. Charlie Brown's sister Sally, for instance, has her own theory about extinction. My report today is on dinosaurs. The largest dinosaur that ever lived was the bronchitis. It soon became extinct. It coughed a lot. <laughs> School children today are being purged of some myths about dinosaurs. For example, because of museum displays and movies, they've always believed dinosaurs dragged their tails, yet tail tracks have rarely been found alongside foot tracks. But today we know dinosaurs didn't drag their tails. Some used them for balance, others for weapons. Paleontologist Bob Bakker tells about some other myths. The traditional view of dinosaurs has three fundamental tenets. Dinosaurs were dim-witted, dinosaurs were slow-moving, and dinosaurs were swamp-bound. Now, you go to a museum or look up pictures of Brontosaurus in a popular book, and you see this great animal up to its armpits in a swamp. Nearly everywhere, Brontosaurus is portrayed as being limited to this hot, humid, murky environment. That's total, complete bunk. Brontosaurus liked dry environments upland environments, not swamps. They favored the dry conifer forest, and their preferred food wasn't some sort of watercress, but conifer needles. We also used to think that the brontosaurus was the largest dinosaur in existence. In 1979, Dr. Jim Jensen of Brigham Young University discovered a gigantic pelvic bone, which challenges that contention. Jensen has done some best guess arithmetic in designing, and he believes that when he finds the rest of this massive giant and assembles it, he will have what is being called the Ultrasaurus. If the Brontosaurus weighed 33 tons and was 70 feet long, 
then the Ultrasaurus may have weighed 150 tons and been over 100 feet long, five times bigger, a gigantic creature. If you were to take an elevator to the top, you would travel six stories up. If Jensen's calculations turn out to be correct, then the Ultrasaurus would probably have had to eat almost five tons of forage a day. The question remains, was his mouth large enough to take in that much food in a 24-hour period? If the Ultrasaurus is the largest known dinosaur, then the most recently discovered dinosaur in Holbrook, Arizona is among the smallest. Unearthed by paleontologist Rob Long and his team of University of California scientists, the bones indicate this dinosaur is no bigger than a German shepherd. Some dinosaurs are believed to have been as small as chickens. Long believes this to be a plateosaur. It could be the oldest complete skeleton of a dinosaur this small. The baby duckbill would reach the size of the plateosaur or a German shepherd very quickly. He would still be too short to reach the best foliage. Duckbills, it's estimated, ate about 200 pounds of foliage a day, and like a cow or an elephant today, spent most of his waking hours eating. Eating techniques have to be learned, and the duckbills seem to have spent time with their young teaching them. But like all of nature's creatures, the child must one day go exploring by himself. Duckbill tail weighed 2,000 pounds. If it were fortunate enough to catch the Tyrannosaurus rex off guard and knock it off its feet, it would have enough time to escape. For once down, the Tyrannosaurus rex couldn't get up easily. But if the Tyrannosaurus rex was denied today, he would almost certainly prevail another day. He was called Tyrannosaurus Rex, the tyrannical king lizard. He was carnivorous, a voracious meat eater. His teeth were designed for one function and one function only, to tear flesh from bones. He was probably slow and awkward, and so some scientists think that he, like his relative, the Gorgosaurus, may not have been an effective hunter. He might have been a giant scavenger. Well, the chances are that he was both. One thing seems certain, though. He was a loner, and the rest of his kingdom lived in fear of him. Among those who lived in his kingdom were the Monoclonius. Like our duckbills, these vegetarians also herded together for protection. They were slow moving. Their single horn and their thick hides were their only defense. Terror is signaled by the snap of a twig.
18 feet tall, 40 feet long, the Tyrannosaurus rex had powerful hind legs that could propel him forward relentlessly. Tyrannosaurus rex is a big lizard-like animal, and he likes eating everyone up, and he's a mean guy. <laughs> well, he's big, he's mean, he has really long teeth, and his arms he can't use. It's a big um, animal, and it has sharp teeth and a long tail, and short hands and long legs. If I ever met it with a Tyrannosaurus rex, I'd probably run him down with a shotgun. Waste them with a cannon. It is the violent Tyrannosaurus rex and other meat eaters like the Ceratosaurus and the Allosaurus that have been so strongly impressed in our imaginations. The roaring and the screaming of the primordial titans continues to echo across the years to remind us that we would have only been two quick bites to a Tyrannosaurus rex. <laughs> He seems to have no equal. He has been celebrated as invincible. But in the 1932 movie King Kong, Tyrannosaurus Rex met his match. King Kong was the creation of Hollywood. He was fiction. But then so much of what Hollywood filmed about the dinosaurs was also fiction. We already know the movie makers mistakenly put man among the dinosaurs. Man didn't even exist for another 60 million years. But I wonder if we had lived among the dinosaurs, would we really have been such enemies? Well, we are in the movies, and the dinosaurs always seem to have the upper hand, or at least the upper horn. They came out of caves, crossed mountains, and roared up out of the seas, these movie monsters. Always they appeared to be larger than life. They're our favorite monsters. It almost seems that as an audience, we're rooting for them to win. Some of us would like to think that they still exist. If they do, where could they be? Many believe that a dinosaur still lives beneath the waters of this mysterious lake in Scotland, Loch Ness. Each spring, a number of sightings of the creature or creatures that allegedly live in this lake makes international news. Recently, an expedition set out to get hard evidence to prove the existence of the monster that many claim is a plesiosaur. Called Nessie, the creature has often been the source of hoaxes and fake photographs. 
A recent expedition placed a high-speed camera underwater. A sonar device would trigger as the shutter on the camera recorded the passing of any large creature. The camera took these two pictures. Is this the fin of a plesiosaur? Does a plesiosaur or family of plesiosaurs still live in the waters of Loch Ness? Another unexplained creature is said to inhabit Lake Telly in the African Congo. Located 450 miles inside the smothering jungle, Lake Telly is largely unexplored. The natives say they've seen an animal that resembles a brontosaurus. In 1906, African explorers scoffed at another incredible story, one that told of a giant ape man still undiscovered, a gorilla. In 1981, explorer Herman Ragusters reported that the natives could identify pictures of an animal they called Mokili Mabembe. I believe there's an animal in the Congo Basin because I personally saw it, and that's my strongest argument. Um, the, not only did I see it, but there were 22 other people who simultaneously witnessed the animal. The best I can describe the animal uh, to someone who wasn't there is that it had a long serpentine-like neck and a broad back that extended about 15 feet. Now, I estimated that the creature was probably on the order of 35 feet long. This is a photograph Herman Ragusters claims is the surfacing head and neck of a living dinosaur. He also claims to have recorded the sound. A living dinosaur? Myth or reality? A recent movie called Baby decided to refer to it as a legend. You don't belong to me. Just another legend? If we let it be. Come on. Ah. Paleontologists seem to like the idea of the possibilities. Like most scientists uh, who work on dinosaurs, I'm probably a romantic and would love to believe in things like the Loch Ness Monster or the, uh, the Brontosaur in the Congo. But uh, until some hard evidence comes forth, it's very difficult to believe in it. It is possible that there is a dinosaur in the Congo. It is doubtful, that, extremely doubtful, that a dinosaur could be present in Loch Ness. I'm personally rather skeptical, but I would encourage anyone who wants to try because in this attempt to understand, um, they are going to learn something, and so are we. If there are dinosaurs living today, they would be survivors of the extinction that has mystified scientists. There are many theories about their extinction. One is that the dinosaur's destiny was written in the sky. A cosmic shower of asteroids or a large meteor struck the Earth with an astounding impact. It created an impenetrable dust veil that blocked out the sun, killing off much of the plant life. An Earth robbed of the life-giving force of the sun, the theory holds, would soon be deprived of food for the plant-eating dinosaurs. Their passing would soon deprive the meat-eating giants of food. It was like a nuclear winter the Earth suffered an untold loss of life. In a matter of months, the food chain would have broken down. The largest and the most dominant creatures on Earth perished. 
For the dinosaurs, it was the end of a 140 million year reign on Earth. Scientists agree that an asteroid killed the dinosaurs. Paleontologist Bob Bakker. We've had a nice explanation for dinosaur extinctions starting about 100 years ago. It's simply that the whole landscape of the Earth changed. That shallow seas drained off the continents, that the temperatures started getting colder in the winter, deep inland. And that animals that used to be living on separate continents now could mingle. And as they mingled, these foreign species brought in foreign diseases. And that combination, a change in climate and a mingling of foreign diseases, always causes extinction today. You can see it happening on every continent. And the end of the Cretaceous would have been no different. We don't need a cosmic zap. We have a nice, well-studied, earthly mechanism to kill off the dinosaurs. I think some scientists the majority of scientists uh, probably believe in gradual extinction of dinosaurs. But uh, there's certainly a growing amount of evidence suggesting they may have become extinct rapidly as well. I don't care what killed the dinosaurs. I, for me, it's very important to study and learn why the dinosaurs were so successful. Not all life on Earth was extinguished with the dinosaurs. The smaller animals emerged to fill the evolutionary niche left vacant by the demise of the dinosaur. Among them were those that dwelled in the trees and beneath the ground, like the mammal. among us today animals that lived at the time of the dinosaurs. The crocodile, as a family, survived the extinction. They live among us today as smaller versions of the 50-foot giants they were 65 million years ago. Why they survived is still a mystery. It is the present-day birds, like this flightless ostrich, that may indeed be direct descendants of the dinosaur. Some leading scientists believe that birds are dinosaurs. Fossilized imprints of feathers confirm the surprising contention that through evolution, some dinosaurs developed feathers and hollow bones. This eventually enabled them to fly to safety and survival. How might the dinosaurs have evolved if they hadn't disappeared? Dr. Dale Russell has a theory. Dinosaurs were on the surface of our planet as the dominant forms of life on Earth for a very long period of time. And during that time, dinosaurs evolved. One of the most interesting evolutionary trends in dinosaurian history is a trend towards a larger brain size than some of the smaller flesh-eating forms. Had the dinosaurs not become extinct, then it is certain that they would have continued to evolve. And in the 65 million years that separates the end of the dinosaurs from ourselves, it is quite legitimate to speculate that some of the largest brain dinosaurs may have looked something like this creature here. Dr. Russell's dinosauroid has a hauntingly familiar look about him. His large brain, body, fingers, and his two legs mark him really as a dinosaur man. Dinosaur man. Well, I'm kind of glad I don't look like that. But I'm not so happy about the fact that they're gone. This is their legacy. This and the fantasy of the movies and television, toys, t-shirts, but really, the legacy goes beyond these things because dinosaurs teach us about evolution and about survival. And they challenge us to learn about their mysteries. We are, in fact, only on the threshold of knowing about these beasts. 
they're still locked in our imagination. They're not creatures from museums or fossil beds. They're made of more than rock and sand. They're eternal because they live in our imagination.